I'm happy to see them going and doing what God has called them to do. It blesses my heart, every one of them. And so we just thank the Lord uh, for that. How many know God has your best interests at heart? Somebody say amen. He loves you. He cares about you. Uh, we were talking with people uh, this past week about, uh, you know, starting a, a garden next year out here. And uh, different ones who had came and said, Pastor, we'd like to be a part of this. And I want you to know we're going to we're going to circle that around and start dealing with that. And and uh, that will be something that we are definitely uh, considering doing. And uh, I loved uh, I saw some uh, Sherry and uh, was showing us some great stuff uh, that uh, is this your son who has the garden or no, it's a different one. OK. And uh, their church does it, and boy, wow, it really ministers to a lot of people. And with us having the food pantry, it would be a great thing. And uh, we just need people that would want to be a part and do it. And also, Rick wanted me to announce that he's uh, uh, next Sunday, they'll be having their Bible study at their house. And I told him this uh, yesterday that I would do that. I would uh, announce that for them. They're out of town and I guess I got Miss Maureen sitting on the front row this morning. Uh, she usually sits back there with them, and she moved up here. And so uh, that's awesome. We praise the Lord uh, for that. But aren't you glad to be in God's house? Amen. Aren't you glad? You know, I, I just kept thinking all weekend how blessed I am, you know, and, and, and to be free uh, to know that, that Jesus Christ uh, is living and moving and breathing uh, within our heart. And as the worship team was singing that last song, I want you to know we got to know who we are in Jesus Christ. Father, we just thank you today that, Lord, that you love us. I thank you as stand put on the sign. You are the bread of life. And I thank you, Lord, that, Lord, there's no one that can come to the Father unless they come by you. And we pray today, Lord, that you minister to our hearts. It's our communion Sunday here at Crossroads. And, Lord, I pray for all the listeners that are listening with our Internet and, God, the web today. I thank you for all the, the gracious support that so many of them have been such a blessing to our church, uh, giving and sowing into our ministries. And, Lord, our church, and I thank you for that, and I pray you bless it back to them, and I pray people all over the country and even uh, some that are in foreign countries that listen to us, and we thank you, Lord, for God, their, uh, their obedience, Lord, in doing this, and I just ask you to bless your word today, and Lord, just, uh, Lord, just give us what we need today. We pray that the Holy Spirit would just come alive in each and every one of us. And, Lord, touch our hearts, and we're going to give you the praise. And the church said, amen. amen, and amen, and amen. Why don't you tell your neighbor this morning, hallelujah, there's healing in Jesus. Come on, tell them, there's healing in Jesus, there's healing in Jesus, there's healing in Jesus, amen. I believe that uh, with all my heart, there's healing, healing, healing uh, in the Lord and Savior uh, Jesus Christ, and we praise the Lord, we praise the Lord uh, for his blessing, we thank him, uh, you know, for his goodness and his grace to each of our hearts, you know, and he's so good to <clears throat> to all of us. If you got your Bibles, I want you to go with me uh, to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, uh, this morning, we're going to read about the Good Samaritan, and uh, you know, last Sunday we had a had a powerful service, and I was preaching about Jonah. I don't know how many of you already forgot it, but we were preaching about Jonah last Sunday morning. And, uh, you know, Jonah, he didn't want his enemies to be saved. You know, he got on a ship. He went the opposite direction. And uh, even in his uh, thinking, he could outrun God. I want to say it again. How many know you, can outrun, you cannot outrun God? Amen? I don't care how hard you try or... Or maybe got in your heart or mind that you can do it. It isn't going to happen. You're not going to outrun him. But uh, we had a gentleman that was passing through uh, our service. And when most of you were eating lunch, I was dealing with a, 
situation, Debbie and I, with a gentleman uh, that had been stranded here in Cameron. And, uh, you know, uh, the remarkable thing is God had been planting seeds in this man all the way. He, he was from Florida, and I appreciate Linda, you guys helping him at the blessing room. And uh, uh, we were able to get him on a bus and get him home. And I was able to talk to his pastor back in uh, Florida, and uh, he was uh, a part of a missions church, uh, a new work that had started back there. And uh, this gen gentleman hadn't eaten in four days. Come on, are you hearing me? Hadn't had a bite of food in four days, and he was uh, uh, carrying a, a, a really bad leg, and he had a bad limp, and I, I kind of understood that, you know? And when I saw him and he said, you know, I've, I've been everywhere. I've tried to get some assistance. I've just tried to get back home. I'll pay you back. Just help me. Um, you know, and he, he was telling me and sharing his story. I called the resources he gave me. And because we live in a day where there's so many scams. Come on, listen to me. You got to be careful sometimes. And so I, I got numbers. I called people. His story lined up everywhere he told me. And uh, the situations that he told me. And so I knew, I knew the Lord had told me to help him get on the right track. But here's what I wanted to say. Uh, the most important thing about Sunday morning is he got saved. Come on, are you hearing me? He got saved. He was in our service. And he said, if I wouldn't have been in the situation I was in, I wouldn't have been in Cameron, Missouri. And he told me the date of last Sunday. And he said, I wouldn't have been born again. But he said, the Lord knew that I needed to hear this message. And he said, Jonah was my favorite of all the Bible. He was my favorite. It was the first story I ever learned in the Bible. And what he told me was, he said, you know, my, my grandfather was the one who taught me about Jonah. He was a Sunday school teacher when I was just a little kid. And he said he died when I was very young. But he said, I, I never forgot the story of Jonah. And he said, when you preach on Jonah, he said, it's like it all came alive uh, to me again. And he said, I received uh, the Lord into my heart. And he said, I just feel so different. I know that I may not look different. I may not. You may look at me. And this guy, you know, he was, he was, he was a very nice guy. But he said, I just uh, I want to commend you in your church for the love you showed me because he said most of them wouldn't let me in the church. Most of them wouldn't let me. Uh, you know, I didn't fit the bill. And uh, no one offered to give me water or food or anything. And he said, here, you know, you're, you're feeding me and you're, you're giving me water and Gatorade and you're trying to help me. And, um, you know, it just broke my heart that, you know, we got to be more uh, interested in doing the work of the Lord. Somebody say amen. We have to, you know, let our Christianity go beyond these four walls. And, uh, you know, God God sends us things uh, sometimes, you know, for a reason. And it was, it was late that afternoon before I even got back to the house uh, trying to help this gentleman. But I want you to know that was a priority was to try to get him home. But when I looked at uh, the book of Luke, chapter 10, and verse number 30. You know, Jesus is dealing with a lawyer. Uh, Bub's going to be a lawyer. And uh, he's dealing with a lawyer. And, you know, he's telling this guy uh, how, how things are and how things should be and how he should live. And he says in reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And when he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes. They beat him. They went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. In other words, he saw him over here, let's say. And instead of walking over here, he walked over here. He didn't walk close to the man. He walked opposite of the man on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. In other words, they didn't want anything to do with the situation in front of them. But a Samaritan, he's a foreigner. He traveled. He came where the man was. And when he saw him, 
He took pity on him. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad God saw me. Come on, somebody. I'm so glad that God had mercy, you know, and love and grace upon my life. And it says that this Samaritan, he went to him and he bandaged his wounds. He poured on oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey and he brought him to an inn and he took care of him. And the next day, he took out two denarii, and he gave them to the innkeeper. And this is what he told the innkeeper. He said, look after him. When I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. And then the word of God, Jesus says, which of these three, lawyer, do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the expert in the law, the lawyer replied, the one who had mercy. On him and Jesus told him he said you go and you do likewise and I want you to understand that so many time uh, you know we look at this and we think wow how could this guy just go out of his way to help someone else how could this guy have such a heart that you know he would minister to this guy spend his own money bandage him up take care of his wounds you know when I looked at the denarii, it was uh, unusual, usually a daily, a daily wage, and he paid him two days' wage, and he said, I'm going to give you this, and if it costs any more, he said, I will pay it for you, but what the, the story is teaching us and what Jesus is teaching the, the student of the law is that the good Samaritan was the one that saw the need, and I want you to understand that you know, it, it teaches true love for God and caring for the needs of others. You know, we can say we love God, but how can we love God if we don't love our brother? Come on, somebody. How can we help God and, and be a part of what God is doing if we truly don't allow ourselves uh, to be caught up in it? I'll be honest with you. I wanted to go home and eat lunch, too. I wanted to do the work, uh, you know, and uh, there was a party I wanted to go to that night. I didn't even get to go to, and I wanted to, and as I told Jim and Susie, I would have loved to have come to your party. I would have. Uh, it was just I, I, I was caught up in doing the work of the ministry, and I want you to understand that the most unlikely source ministered to this man's wound. You know, this Samaritan, he proved that he was a good neighbor. He proved that, you know, that, that he was someone that when you look at his life, you could count on him and you could know that, you know, he cared. He, he had compassion. He had concern. And when I started thinking about this, we've all been in situations where, uh, you know, we've had opportunities to bless someone or to help someone or encourage someone or strengthen someone. We've been in those uh uh, situations in our life and some of you can say hey you know pastor I, I've went through emotional or I've went through physical or I've went through a uh, spiritual hurts and uh, maybe there hurts in your life that uh, you have carried and you've carried them for a long time and you've wanted someone to just take notice and someone listen to honestly uh, you know take a moment and say hey I'm praying for you or you know what can I do to uh, assist you or help you and when I started thinking about this I was thinking about scars you know we have them we have uh, uh, many scars in our life you know that uh, we tend to forget that uh, what happened in our life you know uh, uh, the situations that went down and I I'm here to tell you that how I many you know scars are for healing can you say man they're for healing and God doesn't want us to forget that uh, what we're going through. You know, uh, uh, I've got a long one right here on my hip right now, and it's been trying to heal in the last couple of weeks. Uh, I keep breaking the top part. I break, I've broken it open a couple times, and I had to go back to the doctor once already. And, uh, you know, it, it was just, he said, it takes time. It takes time to heal. And I, I can tell you, you know, when, when the scar uh, begin to open up, it made me realize, oh, it's still there. 
uh, you know, and it, it still uh, is something that I'll have for the rest of my life. But when I look at it, I can remember how I used to limp, and I was telling Medi how I used to come to the pulpit, and I'd preach, and I'd be in so much pain uh, because of my hip hurting, uh, just standing on my leg. Uh, I remember how the Lord, uh, you know, was so gracious to, to give me a new hip. Come on, are you hearing me? And some of you, you're, you've forgotten, you know, how God, he's brought you out. He's helped you. And uh, some of you, you've gone through wrecks. Some of you, you've gone through uh, injuries. Some of you, uh, it could be body parts that you've had to replace or redo. You know, it could be a hip. It could be a knee. Uh, it could be a, a gallbladder. It could be a, a something to do with your sugar or diabetes or, or maybe a collarbone or a broken uh, limb. I, you know, we, we go through all kinds of things. But when I looked at uh, Psalms 22, of verse number 16, it says, Dogs surround me, a pack of villains encircle me, the peace of my hands and my feet. You know, when, when I started thinking this, you know, it's almost like this man, he said to me, he said, you know, uh, I remember one night I was, I was sleeping here on a corner and it just in a building lot that I'd found. And he said, these dogs came up and he said, I didn't know if they were friendly or not. And he said, I got to thinking, oh, Lord, please. He said, I called out to the Lord and I said, Lord, please uh, don't let these animals hurt me. And I said to him, I said, what happened? And he said, immediately, he said, I just kind of easily struck my hand out. And he said, one of the dogs, you know, grabbed and ran off. The other dog, a big dog, came to me. And he said, he smelt my hand. And he started licking my hand. And he said, I just said, Lord, thank you. And the dog turned and he went away. And he said, I knew they were stray dogs. But he said, I, I just wanted to tell you, Pastor, that, you know, even in our fears, God can show up. Come on, are you hearing me? God can be there. And he said, that's what got me to really thinking. I need to set in a service. And even though some did not want me in the service, he said, I wanted to try to go to a service one more time. And he came and the Lord saved him. Come on. Amen. And the Lord ministered to him. And so many of you were kind to him. And he told me that. And you know, when we look at our, our scars, they are uh, many times hidden from view. Uh, uh, scars are, uh, they could be verbal, they could be physical, they could be from abuse, they could be from divorce. Uh, some scars are from traumatic losses or deaths. Uh, some are from betrayal by people uh, we trusted or loved or we thought were our friend or we thought that they were our family and they would always have our back. But every affliction, every Every scar, I want you to understand, has a purpose. Uh, when you look at a scar, uh, they aren't pretty many times, but they are part of us uh, nonetheless. Uh, they don't fade. Uh, the reason why is because they tell a specific story uh, from tragedy to glory to accident to fertility. Uh, I want you to understand they remind us of where uh, we once were. We could be broken. We could be in pain. Uh, we could have been in shame at the time, or we could have been in hurt or some type of tragic situation. And I begin to to think how important it is that we understand that God wants to use our, our scars, listen, uh, to minister to us and to remind us that even though we went through it, how many know he went through it with us? Come on, somebody. And he's there, listen, uh, to make uh, impulse and help to, to our needs. And you know, uh, uh, sometimes uh, they don't hide. Uh, sometimes we wear scars as a proof uh, that God did heal us. You know, never be ashamed of, uh, of a scar. A new young lady who, who got, uh, uh, you know, mugged one time and she had a scar uh, down the side of her face where uh, the robber had cut her. And uh, she had many stitches. And I remember uh, she was so ashamed. She would wear her hair down over her. She would wear scarves that would cover her. She said, oh, I, I, I don't want people to see my scar. And I remember telling her one time, uh, you know, but you don't have to be ashamed of that scar. It simply means that you were stronger than whatever tried to hurt you. Come on. You were braver than whatever, listen, uh, came against your life. And so all of us at some point or time in our life, we have had to uh, uh, deal with a 
situation where we had a scar. But you remember that God doesn't give us scars uh, to remind us that we've been hurt. But he gives them to us to remind us that we have been healed. Come on, somebody. And he tells us that, listen, just like I healed you back then, how many know I can heal you now and I can minister to your heart and life? I can set you free and I can change you, says the Lord. The first thing that popped in my head was scars can have purpose. You know, in 2 Corinthians 11, 24 and 25, five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. And Paul says, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I want you to know, Paul bore the scars of his relationship, of walking and serving his master, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And when I thought about them beating him, you know, and ripping the flesh off of his back, I'm here to tell you the scars that, that Paul endured, uh, if you were to look at them, they weren't very glamorous. Come on. They would not be something that you would want to see. It's no different than the Lord who took the, the stripes upon his back that you and I could go free and we could be healed. And, and I'm sure that uh, the cat of nine tails and the bone and, and listen, the grit and the stone that went across Christ's back, you know, he was unrecognizable according to Isaiah 53. But I'm here to tell you, he did it because he loved us. He cared about us. And, and you know, those scars prove that, you know, he was in it for the get-go. Come on, somebody. He wasn't going to quit on you. He didn't quit on me. And how many know you can call upon him? He's as close as the mention of his name. When I looked at Colossians 2, verse 14, it says, Having concealed the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us, condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. None of us, when we think about Jesus, can deny, you know, his dedication to the Lord. You know, I, I got to think about how that, you know, Paul and Jesus and all those disciples, they were so, uh, you know, engulfed in what they were doing. And Paul, you know, he depicted his obedience, his loyalty, his faithfulness to our Lord and Savior. I was watching a special uh, not too long ago, and it was of uh, Dave Reaver, a Vietnam vet. And Dave Reaver, this Vietnam vet, I'd actually seen him in person many years ago. And he had a grenade blow up uh, when he was serving for our United States military. And I want you to know, many parts of his body had to be put back together. And in the video, Dave Reaver, he's playing the piano. And then he stopped and he said, hey, how many of you know I play by ear? And he took his ear off and he actually started playing. And I thought, my goodness, I, I didn't even remember he did that. And he had a testimony. He traveled all over the world, and he traveled around the United States for many years. And he said, I do this because my scars, they show people of the mercy and grace of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And, you know, when you look at the lines and the scars and the marks that you've endured, listen, in your life, in my life, uh, scars, they have a purpose of whether you've been hurt or whether you've been abused or, or whether you've been ridiculed or shamed or you can lift your head you can count your blessings you know God has brought you out God is going to continue to bring you out you know when you look at it you remember how the Lord he took care of the situation and he made a way where there seemeth to be no way when I looked at Hebrews 12 verse 2 Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer, the perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. It scorned his shame. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I want you to know he did the ultimate. He had the ultimate scars, as I'll talk about in a minute. But you know he did it because he loved us. He cared about us. He's concerned with us. That's why God so loved the world. He sent his only begotten son. Whosoever believes in him will not perish but have life everlasting. When we look at Galatians 3, verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. 
Do you understand it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree or a pole? And I got to thinking about this. He took on the curse. He took on, you know, all the sins that we had created. He who knew no sin, he became a propitiation or mercy seat covering of for our sins. Why did he do this, Pastor Tim? Because scars have a purpose. And I want you to understand the only scar in heaven is going to be on the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he's here to remind us what he did for each and every one of us when he died for our sins. The second thing I begin to notice, not only do scars have purpose, but pain and scars are real. If you've ever gone through pain, which I know many of you have, and if you've ever had, you know, some type of wound or cut or scar, I want you to understand, you know, that it's real. Pain and scars are real. You know, uh, I, I thought about from bike wrecks to, you know, falling out of trees to, you know, uh, big ray uh, sporting events and, uh, you know, getting the knee fixed or, you know, breaking my arm or, you know, having to have an uh, emergency appendicitis or, you know, the gallbladder surgery or taking cancer off my back. I was looking at that scar this morning and I was thinking, I I remember the pain, but I also remember as I look at the scar, why God brought me through. And they are real. And so when we think about it in John 20, verse 24, let's read Luke 10, 34 first and see what the Good Samaritan said. He went to him. He bandaged his wounds. He poured on oil and wine. In other words, he was trying to fix what had been beaten and hurt and broken. Then he put the man on his own donkey. You know, and he brought him to an end, and he took care of him. I want you to know this perfect stranger reached out to him. It's like my my cousin who lives in Gillette, Wyoming, Paulette. Uh, She's older than I am, about 10 years. She's my oldest cousin. And she had reached out to Debbie and I the other night, and she's getting ready for a double knee replacement. And Paulette said, she said, I've been so down because her husband passed away two or three years ago, and she said, you know, I'm all alone, and the kids are living way down south, and she goes, I, I, just, I just feel so out of it. And she said, and, and then she said, I had this guy. I was going to the mailbox, and I was stumbling around, and this guy come over, and he helped me pick up my mail, and he's a young guy. And she said he stopped, and he, he, he told me, he said, it looks like you're hurting. She said, I'm in so much pain. And this young guy said, is it okay if I pray for you? I'm a born-again Christian, and uh, I believe the Lord still heals. Come on, are you hearing me? And my cousin said, yes. And this young guy prayed for her. And then she said, after he prayed for her, she went in the house. She hadn't been in the house very long, and somebody came with a UPS package, and usually they just leave it on the porch. And she said she went to open the door, and uh, she said, this lady saw her, and she said, you know, I, I, I've never delivered to you before, but I know God sent me on this route because as I was driving over here, I'm a born-again, spirit-filled Christian. Come on, are y'all hearing me? And the Lord told me, the lady you're going to deliver this package to needs you to pray for her and tell her that I love her. Tell her, tell her that I care about her. And my cousin said, Tim, this is amazing. This perfect stranger. I didn't even know her. I was so down in the dumps. And she laid her hands on my head and she prayed for me. And she said, don't you worry. Everything's going to be all right. And God's got you. He's watching over you. And most of all, remember, God loves you. And my cousin said, at that moment, it's like the pain just dissipated. And she said, even though I have so much pain in my knees, she said, you know, the scars and, and I know in my body are going to be real. But what she said to me is she said, I know God sent them two people to me. And they were strangers and they cared about me. And so I went to John 20, verse 24 and 25. And what it says in this is that Thomas, also known as Denimus, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. You remember when he resurrected, he met them in the upper room. And so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, the scars, and I put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, Thomas said, I will not believe. 
from that period, you know, they started calling him Doubting Thomas. And there were those that doubted, see, that Christ had risen again and the Lord had appeared to Thomas, you know. Uh, the Lord had appeared to the disciples and Thomas wasn't present to visually see Christ for himself. The others saw him and they knew that it was Jesus. Jesus had resurrected from the dead. And you know, there are those in our services today and in our world today that they don't know the Lord. They don't know that he can heal, he can deliver, he can do all these things. And he is risen. Come on, can you say amen? amen. He is risen. And so Thomas demands, he said, unless I see the scars as proof that he is the Lord and Savior. In other words, what he was saying, to put it in our language, is I got to see it to believe it. I got to see it. I got to see someone get healed from cancer. I got to see uh, someone, you know, get up and walk. It couldn't walk. It were crippled. I got to see someone with a blinded eyes open. And through the centuries, you know, uh, you know, people have always done the same thing. But what do scars represent to Thomas? They were proof that he was the Lord. They were proof that it was the resurrection. But when I started thinking about this, to express doubts, Thomas, he began to say, unless I see it, I'm not going to believe it. What is it? What has got to happen to us? As I told you last week, what's got to happen in our life so that we can believe that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and his word does not change? What has got to happen in our life so that we know that he's working on our behalf? What has got to happen to know that he always comes through just like he says he comes through? Thomas, unless I see it, I want to see his hands where they nailed him. I want to see his feet where he took the scars, the scars Jesus bore. They represented to Thomas his pain. They represented his suffering. They were proof that it was Christ. It was Christ. Only he would have the nail prints in his feet and in his hands. It represented his love. And Paul writes of Christ's appearance. And when I looked at this in 1 Corinthians 15, 5 through 8, let me give it to you. He appeared to Cephas, and then he appeared to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 other brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some had fallen asleep. Come on, listen to that. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And at last of all, he appeared to me also and to one abnormally born. I want you to understand the scars represent he is risen. He is risen. He is risen. We take communion because we know he is the Savior. Come on, somebody. We know that he lives. We know that he is risen again. We know that his healing power still works. It is as true as the blood. I want you to know the blood washes away our sins but how many know by his stripes we are healed he's a healer I don't care what people say. I don't care what scoffers say. I don't care what others teach and preach. I know what the word of God says by his stripes we are healed he's a healer and so it was real scars prove he was real and when I started thinking about that, you know, we know we're full of them. If we went around this room and asked all of you, some of you have got scars on your head. Some of you got scars, listen, on your, on your arm. Some of you got them on your chest. Some of them, they're on your legs. You got them on your feet, your hands. You've got scars. But I'm here to tell you, those scars represented where there was once a wound. Now it's healed up. Come on, somebody. He's a healer. He's a healer. When I looked at Philippians 2, verse 6 and 7, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. In other words, he didn't play the father card. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. I want you to know Christ was human. How many of you know yet Christ was divine? He was divine. He was human, but he was divine. His sacred hands and feet. You don't think it hurt when they drove those spikes into his feet, into his hands? I want all you thinkers to think about that. Five to eight inch spikes. And they drove them, you know, into, and, and I promise you those soldiers wouldn't tap them lightly. They were 
pounding those spikes, pounding those nails to try to get them into his uh, feet and his hands. They tore bone. They tore tissue. I want you to understand. But he did it. He took the pain so that he bore our pain. Can you say man? You know, he felt pain. We feel pain. He suffered. You suffer. You know, scars to Thomas were evidence, proof that Jesus died and he rose again. And, you know, life left him scarred. And I got to thinking about this. He showed them his wounds. He showed them his feet. He showed them his hands. That's incredible. That's love at the highest point. They remind me of what he went through. He took the, uh, you know, the crown of thorns upon his head. He took the spear into his side. You know, he did all this, the beatings and the floggings and the beard being plucked out and everything else so that you and I could go free. That's love. That's love. They remind me this is what our Savior went through. As He reaches to us, He reminds us today, I love you. I love you. And it's like this gentleman said to me Sunday, last Sunday, why? Why would you help me? I'm a perfect stranger. You never met me before. And I said to him, because God loves you. Somebody say amen. He loves you. You're important to God. And he said, I am. And I said, you are. You're important to God. When you get back to where you're going, get involved. Support your pastor. Get involved. He's doing a great work in the mission work there. Get involved. I said, you know, God's going to use you. He's got a plan for you. This is just the beginning for you. But I said, I want you to understand, Christ loved you so much that he died for you. And he rose again. He rose again. Come on, somebody praise him with me this morning. He rose again. Hallelujah. He rose again. He lives. Come on, church. He lives. We're not serving some dead deity today. We're not serving some falsehood today or mythology today. I want you to know we are serving the risen Christ, the true living Son of God. He's alive and he lives, the Scripture says, forevermore. And then the last thing. Not only are pain and scars real, real, but we have to act and stop doubting, and we have to believe. We have to act and start doubting and believe. See, the man, the good Samaritan, he acted. You know, the priest came by. You would have think that he would help him, but the priest was too busy, or he didn't want to get involved, or, you know, he didn't want to take the time to help the stranger. I don't know. It's beside me. Why he didn't stop and help him. But the priest went on the other side of the road. Then the Levite, who's also a man of God, he comes by and he sees him. He knows that he's in trouble. But he too passed by. I don't understand that. If you're a man of God, a true man of God, a true woman of God, you know, and you see someone hurting or, or beaten or whatever, you want to help them. Come on, amen. You want to help them. They pass on the other side. And then here comes the good Samaritan. He stops what he's doing. He goes out of the way. He's not even a Jew. And yet he stops and he lends the man help and support. He gets him to where he needs to go. He bandages up his wounds. He cares about him. He comforts him. I want you to know he takes care of his need. How many of you know that that's what Christ does for us? He picks up the pieces. The enemy tries to scatter us all abroad. He tries to mess us up and break us up and, ble and you know, does everything in his power. Listen, to destroy us. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus comes along. He picks up the pieces. He puts us back together. He said, because I come and I give you life and I give it to you more abundantly. You say, wow, once was an addict, which you're not an addict anymore. You've been saved. You've been redeemed. I once, you know, was a, uh, a person that lied all the time, but you're not a liar anymore. He, he changed you. Uh, I once was this or once was that. Some of you say, I once was, you know, I had a lust problem, and he changed it. He turned it around. What I'm trying to tell you today is this. You know, if you believe, all things are possible unto them who believe in him. In John 20, 26 to 31, about to wrap it up. 
A week later, his disciples were in the house again. This time, Old Doubt and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came. He came right through the door. He stood among them and he said, peace be with you. Now listen to this. He says to Thomas, hallelujah, put your finger here. He knew what Thomas thought. He knew what Thomas said. Put your finger here. I want you to touch my, my hands. I want you to touch my feet. See my hands? Reach out your hand. Put it into my side, the Lord said. The Lord said, stop doubting and believe. Come on, you know what he told me to tell the church? Stop doubting and believe. You know, if you can believe, God can turn that thing around. If you can believe, God can change that situation. Come on, somebody. Thomas said to him, when he saw them feet and them hands and that side, my Lord and my God. You know, for him to see it, he believed, but faith is believing without seeing. Come on, church. Faith is you believe in your heart. You know it in your spirit. You know. I'm telling you right now, I know Jesus is alive. I know Jesus is real. I know Jesus heals. I know he changes. I know he saves people. My wife should have died five years ago. But I'm telling you, we serve a healer this morning. Come on, somebody. What are you saying, Pastor Tim? I'm saying we serve a healer. Come on, church. I got people in here that you were once lost, dead in your sins. But God has saved you and forgave you. Jesus told him, because you've seen me, you believe. But blessed are those who have not seen, yet have they believed. I love that. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. He did so many miracles. But those are written that you may believe, all of us, that we may believe that Jesus is the Messiah. How many know he's Yeshua this morning? He's the Son of God. And by believing, you may have life in his name. No other name like Jesus. One look. I want you to know, I believe not even a feel. Thomas cries out, my Lord, my God. Jesus told him, stop doubting, believe. You know, if, if you have honest doubt, Give him a try this morning. Thomas doubted. He was unsure. But he, he also showed up. I know we, we talk a lot about Thomas and his doubt. But Thomas was a good man. He was a faithful disciple. He didn't pull away or go off from the group. You know, he just doubted. It's simple. And there are many of us that said in the church, we doubt. We don't think God can pull us through or God can make a way or God can answer or God can turn the situation around. But I'm here to tell you, God can do anything. He can do it. And some of you say, why? Because this world, we look at the cross. We look at the tomb and we see the end. We look at the grave, we see the beginning. New life awaits us. Christ, the power of the enemy, sin, even death. He couldn't hold him. I want you to know death. And he can't hold us. He rode the stone away, not to let him out. But how many know he did it to let us in? He wanted us to see what this was all about. Thomas became a believer. And I'm here to tell you this morning, I have seen people healed from all kinds of things. I've seen blind eyes open. I've seen legs that were crippled and so badly crippled that people couldn't walk and God heal them. I've seen the Lord uh, straighten out legs. I've watched God, you know, hear deaf ears. I've seen the Lord touch a mute to give a word in the spirit. And he had never talked and he talked. Come on, are y'all hearing me? The power of God. I've watched God bring people back. Listen, that they were supposed to die and God bring them back. I've seen God touch people with heart problems and cancer and all this kind of stuff. But you know, the greatest miracle of all, I've seen people changed. I've seen people saved. I've seen people delivered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And I'm here to tell you that he is the healer today. As our worship team comes back, John 8, John 20, verse 8 and 9 as I close. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, John, which went inside, he saw and he believed. He saw and he believed. And they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. 
I want you to know he'd been telling them, I'm going to die. I'm going to rise again. They did not understand that. And many of us, we don't understand this, but he tells us, I have risen. I have risen. He tells us he's coming again. How many know Jesus Christ is coming again? Come on, church. He's coming again. I heard someone the other day, and they were talking about, oh, it's not real, and it's phony, and it's this and that. And I said, man, I feel sorry for you because you don't know the Word of God. It's hell, and they don't know the Word of God. You know why? Because if they knew the Word of God, they would know that he's going to split them eastern skies. Come on, somebody. The trump of the Lord's going to sound. Melvin, the dead in Christ are going to rise first. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. It's going to happen. How many know today God wants to touch you? God wants to touch you as you're bowing your heads all over this house. And it's our communion Sunday. And we're getting ready to partake. But before we do, I want you to look at this. And I want to ask you a question. Do you believe? Do you believe that he died for your sins? Do you believe that he rose again? Do you believe that he can take your pain away? He can heal your broken heart and he can restore, listen, your tattered soul. I'm here to tell you today, he's walking these aisles. Holy Spirit is moving among us this morning. He's been on me all morning as I've been preaching. I've been feeling him. He's here. And he's telling you, just believe. Just believe. I don't offer you religion. I don't offer you denomination. I don't even offer you. I mean, that's not what I'm doing. I'm offering you eternal life. Eternal life. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through what? Jesus Christ, our Lord. So today, heads are bowed, eyes are closed before we do our communion. You're here. And you say, Pastor Tim, man, I need the Lord in my heart. I believe. Something is sparking me. Something has turned in me. Something is moving in me. I don't want to be lost. I don't want to be, I don't want to be forgotten or wayward anymore. I realize what you're saying and I have scars to prove he touched me. He healed me. He ministered to me. He kept me for a purpose, a reason. And you're here. Would you lift your hand? Can I see you? Yes, I see the hands. I see the hand. Yes, yes. Yes, I see the hands. Anyone else? Yes, I see the hand. Yes, yes. You put them down. And I want to tell all of us this morning, just because you go to church don't mean you're going to heaven. Did y'all hear that? A lot of people go to church, but they don't go to heaven. Just because you join a church, which I think is a great thing to do, get involved in your church, but it don't make you go to heaven. What's going to seal the deal? You accept Jesus into your heart as your Lord and Savior. You accept Jesus. It's like a young man in India that listens to us on the web. He and his whole family last year got saved listening to our, our ministry. All the way over here, northwest Missouri, and they're in India, and they got saved. And this man, he wrote me a deal saying to me, you know, we had to give up everything because our family didn't own us anymore. They disowned us. We gave it all up. But we found, he said later, a group of believers. And we are now part of the body of Jesus Christ. Come on, are you hearing me? And I thought to myself, we got people right here. They live all around the church. Instead of walking and coming and receiving, they would die and lose their souls. Oh, man, it's a, it's a terrible thing. But I'm so proud today that many of you raised your hands. 
and you said, Lord, I want you as my personal Savior. I want you to pray this prayer with me this morning, all of us. Jesus, thank you for all the pain that you took for me. Thank you for the scars that you bore for me. Proving that you're my Lord and my Savior. I ask you, Jesus, to come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Be Lord and Master of my life. I accept you now as my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for I believe that you are coming into my heart and washing my sins away. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Come on, amen, amen, amen. I would have had you come this morning, but due to time and everything, we have our communion as Melvin and Crystal come. I want you to come this morning and, and uh, just take your cup back. We'll come up, we'll bless it, and uh, we'll partake of the Holy Communion this morning together. Aren't you glad to be in the house of God? Amen. Aren't you glad? Amen. God bless you as you come and bless you guys as you minister song.
Has everyone been served who'd like to be served? We haven't missed anyone. Today as you come with the elements of the bread representing his body and the cup representing his blood, we do this in remembrance of him. For as long as we partake of the bread and we partake of the cup, how many of you know we remember that he died and he rose again for us? Amen? And so I want to encourage you today, whatever you're battling, whatever you're facing, I pray the stripes will come upon you and you'll be healed. I pray today the blood, the blood will forgive you, cleanse you of all your sins. And Jesus, we thank you today because you are Lord and Master of our life. We ask you to bless Holy Communion this morning. And Lord, we represent God, you, by saying here it is. We do this in remembrance of you. You commanded us, Lord, to remember, Lord, what you did. And we do this according to 1 Corinthians 11. And we thank you, Lord, today that by your stripes we're made whole. And we thank you, Lord, that by your blood we are redeemed. And we ask you, Lord Jesus, to just minister to each and every one today. In Jesus' name, the church said, amen and amen. Let's partake together of the bread and the cup. Hallelujah. We praise you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, we praise you, Lord. I thank you for saving me. I thank you for healing me. I thank you, Lord, that you help us all. And I pray you go with us this day, and I pray you encourage your hearts and Lord, bless our families, bless our nation. We pray for Israel today. You bless Israel, Lord. You said you would bless those who bless her, curse those that curse her. We pray for our, our nation today that you bless it, Lord. We need so much help in our nation. And Lord, our nation was founded on the word of truth, the word of God. And so we thank you today, God, for you are the truth. You are the way. You are the life, and we give you all praise and all glory. Amen and amen. God bless you. Shake hands. Thank you for being in the house of the Lord. May God go with you, go with him, and have a wonderful, wonderful week in Jesus.